am now excited to be able to introduce Dr. David Orr, who arrived earlier today after some mechanical difficulties with his plane. <laughs> Dr. Orr's work inspires me and many of us, and we are honored to have him present a shortened keynote address on transforming sustainability education. Oberlin 2020 project founder and a transformative educator and researcher, Dr. Orr is former Paul Sears Distinguished Professor of Environmental Studies and Politics and Senior Advisor to the President at Oberlin College. He has authored seven books with one on the way called Dangerous Years, climate change through the long emergency with release this spring or summer. He also led the effort to design, fund, and build the Adam Joseph Lewis Center at Oberlin, which was named by an American Institute of Architects panel in 2010 as the most important green building of the past 30 years. Dr. Orr has inspired hundreds of academic and industry leaders driving sustainability today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Orr. So this is the shortened version of the talk I was going to give yesterday. Uh, I want to start and uh, acknowledge some people here. First of all, it's great to be here. It's a room full of heroes and heroines. And uh, what you've done collectively is to build a movement that is now a uh, force to really be reckoned with. I want to thank Steve Mulkey, who wasn't the fill-in for me. He was uh, uh, the number one ranked person. And Steve, thanks for, on such short notice, stepping into. Uh, do such a great job. <laughs> Steve did such a good job yesterday that I was asked just to do Q&A with you. So <laughs> this will be short. Um, I want to thank Megan uh, Zonizer for uh, the invitation to be here and for her leadership with AISHI. Uh, she stepped into a tough job and uh, is doing a great job of it. Uh, looking back, this, this movement is, uh, uh, started with very small beginnings, and Tony Cortese is one of the real heroes in the, the movement. Tony and I first met back in the late 1980s when he was at Tufts University and was doing uh, faculty training uh, to get sustainability written into courses, and that was back in the late 1980s and early 90s. And from that, Tony's gone on to do Second Nature and so many other things, and uh, he's still at it. Bob Kester at Ball State, uh, Julian Canary, you met just a moment ago at the National Wildlife Federation. Uh, all of my Oberlin colleagues, I'd like to give a shout out to John Peterson and Sean Hayes and Megan Reister. They're somewhere here with a bunch of Oberlin students, and they're, uh, they're the best colleagues anybody uh, could ever have. And there's a whole generation of younger people coming up in this movement and taking up to uh, even uh, Greater Heights, Mark Orlowski, George Dyer, Tim Carter, and, and so many of you in the room are stepping into that, that role. Um, I want to talk a bit about the, the idea that the topic is sustainability in higher education, and they're, they're not necessarily uh, meant for each other. Uh, and I want to explain that uh, a bit as the talk goes on here for a few minutes. Uh, higher education wasn't created with anything about sustainability in mind. It was formed on uh, different assumptions and presumptions and so forth. And like many of you, the, the discussion about sustainability, your, your emotions kind of swing like a pendulum uh, between, oh my God, and wow. And you get up in the morning and you see the latest uh, numbers on photovoltaics and the cost of PV and the, the possibilities for wind and renewable energy and so many things. And um, it's very exciting. Never before, uh, I believe this is correct to say that never before has technology moved so rapidly. And the progress has been so phenomenal. On the other side, the other bookend, is that the numbers are daunting. This remorseless working of large numbers, whether it's carbon in the atmosphere or species extinction or ocean acidification. So between these two things of euphoria for our technological capacity on one hand, and on the other hand, the, the uh, 
the dread of seeing things come undone. So that is the, uh, that's the backdrop for this, this meeting. But let's start and let's celebrate. For the past 25 years or a bit longer, this movement of sustainability in higher education has been growing. That's called phase one, the green campus movement, recycling, resource flow studies, energy efficiency, green buildings, and now finances and investment and divestment and so forth. Uh, some 700 institutions uh, at last count have signed the President's Climate Action Plan that Tony and Second Nature started. Uh, that's real progress. That is genuine progress. And nobody would have predicted that they or we could have done that much that fast. But that's the easier part. The tougher part is uh, uh, yet to come. That was easy, relatively easy, because it was in our self-interest as institutions, colleges and universities. It was economically justifiable. You could say that uh, we saved money and, and many institutions did. It was beneficial in curriculum and so forth. But it was also easier because it didn't threaten the core mission of higher education as it is presently conceived. So this is a snapshot of what we know. Carbon dioxide over 400 parts per million uh, if you look at carbon dioxide and uh, plus all the other heat trapping gases and CO2 equivalent units, it's around 450 to 470. The lag of 20 to 30 years between what comes out of our tailpipes and smokestacks and the climate change driven weather effects that we see, uh, we'll be lucky to avoid going over 450 parts per million with a temperature increase of two to four degrees. We're now in a race. Sea levels are rising. Jim Hansen's article this past summer projects something like possibly a 10 foot sea level rise by mid-century. Oceans are acidifying faster than anybody thought possible. This is the warmest year on record by a large number and it was likely gonna end as the warmest year ever recorded. Oceans are acidifying, time is short, all is happening faster. All this is connected to international conflict, Syria being a good example. By the time Betsy Colbert wrote The Sixth Extinction, it was already obsolete. Science Magazine put out a report uh, this past summer showing that the rate of extinctions is actually running much faster. And the wild cards in all of this are methane, the Atlantic conveyor belt, the Amazon, and so forth. And then, if that isn't enough, we know that the rules of the game permit uh, players like Exxon Mobil to avoid prosecution for uh, dereliction, that it, it's hard to put a name on it. Bill McKibben calls it evil, uh, call it whatever you will, but they knew from 1977 that burning their product, fossil fuels, oil, and so forth, would wreck the planet, would run the danger of ending civilization. And then there are other threats. This discussion of sustainability that's in the, uh, the title of the program, this organization, is a bigger issue, and there, there are ways to define sustainability as merely an energy issue, but it's bigger than that. The threats to human survival also include nuclear weapons. 10,000 weapons are still on the planet. Poverty is uh, rampant in the world. 85 people, we're told in an Oxfam report, control more net wealth than the bottom 3.7 billion people. Uh, not uh, many weeks ago, Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking, and Stephen Wozniak signed a letter asking governments not to weaponize robots that tells you two things. One is that robots already exist and that they are probably at the point of being weaponized. Uh, 15,000 other scientists and in artificial intelligence signed that document. Um, we're implicated in all of these things. There are lots of ways that we can blow our tenure on the planet. One is to heat it up, one is to wreck the environment, the other is to blow it up, and the third, of course, is to get ourselves evicted by machines smarter than we are. So the conversation has got to be a big conversation. That's what sustainability is all about. All of these things are symptoms. They're not causes particularly, they're symptoms of a deeper thing. There are deeper flaws in our philosophies, paradigms, worldviews, and that is how we think and what we think about. And they indicate deeper failures of heart and compassion as wisdom, as Pope Francis said in Laudato Si. We live in the age of paradox, greater our wealth, we have accompanied with more poverty. Affluence is accompanied by unhappiness and 
enemy weapons with an unsecurity or insecurity, the controlled nature with a planetary environmental crisis, our knowledge with trivial purposes, our communication skills with the fact we don't really have much to say to each other, uh, information with the decline of wisdom. We live in an age of paradox. And then against this backdrop, it's fallen to us in higher education to turn these trends around. I think that we will. But it's not corporations or governments or media that are in the driver's seat, I think, in this. It's, it's education. But we know that the structure of education wasn't entirely uh, uh, made to change the world in the directions we propose. The, the academy designed on the Oxbridge, Germanic, and Johns Hopkins model uh, meant that other things were in the driver's seat, other priorities of power and wealth and mastery. But many of you as faculty members know that the, the pressure for publication means that uh, you're forced into smaller and smaller boxes, that the reward structure for tenure and salary and research funding pushes you away from sustainability. And this vaunted word research we know from Paige Smith once described as busy work on a vast, almost incomprehensible scale, mind-numbing, soul-draining, and often trivial. And then there's the class system in higher education. There are large, well-funded institutions, and there are small, underfunded institutions. And the decline of liberal arts is, for the most part, uh, a national trend. If that wasn't enough, the challenges now connect, how do we teach sustainability? Is it by distance learning and MOOCs or distance uh, learning courses? Is that the right way to teach sustainability? We know that institutions in states run by certain governors, Wisconsin, Ohio, North Carolina, and Florida, for example, budgets are cut and the institutions and sustainability is in jeopardy there. We know that budget cuts throughout most of education means that adjunct professors are now teaching more and more. This in a society spending $1.3 trillion to fight wars or make weapons, and probably at least as much on surveillance now. And then we propose to advance the cause of sustainability in higher education. This is the hard part now. And so this movement, of which we're a part and we've done so much great work and all of you have led in so many ways on your own campuses, but now the hard part is that we have to deal with paradigms and culture and the curriculum and all of those things that, is a, uh, that threaten established interests. And then we have to be very clear, sustainability isn't a matter of squiggly light bulbs and Priuses and green buildings. It's a lot much bigger than that. It's all of that plus much more. It requires solving for what Wendell Berry once described for pattern. And that includes heart, mind, and governance, and economies. It can't be done as islands of sustainability in this larger sea that Richard Falk, the international lawyer, describes as a war system. This is more than just technology but it's what kind of people we are and what kind of people we graduate. Robert Fulgham, in a wonderful book called All I Ever Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, put it this way, not talking about sustainability per se, but it, it's applicable. Clean up your messes, share your cookies, tell the truth, hold hands crossing the street. These are simple things that we all know. That's what sustainability is all about. The starting point for us here is that all education is environmental education. What we include or exclude, we teach young people that they're part of or a part from the great adventure of life. So what's to be done? Here is the, the heart of what I'd like to propose. Let me start with standards for colleges and universities. We've moved those standards. 700 and some institutions have adopted the goal of carbon neutrality or climate neutrality. Divestment of fossil fuels is now well underway and it will gradually move through, or I think rapidly move through, many other institutions. But think of divestment not just from fossil fuels, but also from weapons making companies and chemical agriculture and investing in enterprises that promote life and justice and fairness. We know that building standards are changing, and now most colleges and universities build green buildings and some biophilic buildings, and that is part of the change. But how about zero discharge campuses? How about investing in the local and regional economy? 
How about buying locally and using finance as a tool for sustainability and also a subject for courses? How about orienting students to the ecology of the place and region? How about weaving environmental studies and environmental thinking and ecological science throughout the whole curriculum? How about talking about the big issues? Higher education strikes me often as being uh, better known for the triviality of what we discuss than the large issues. And then how about the capacity of revoking degrees for repeated ecological stupidity? Uh, <laughs> Should I mention Ted Cruz in Harvard? Or Jim Imhoff in the University of Tulsa, but there are lots of others. Let's go to a second level. How about boards and administration? How about no president, no institution head can be illiterate ecologically? So trustees and deans and department chairs have to pass a, a test devised by faculty for ecological literacy. To get, a, uh, to get a driver's license, you have to take a test. Otherwise, you drive cars into other things and in the ditches. How about getting the test for being the head of an institution so you don't drive it into an ecological ditch? How about a reading test? What do presidents and board members read? Let me suggest that they start by reading Naomi Klein, This Changes Everything. Or Betsy Colbert, The Sixth Extinction, or anything by Herman Daly. And then let's make the point that large endowments, which we rigorously protect, are of no use on a ruined planet. And how about surrendering or confiscating all endowment funds over, let's say, $10 billion to be put into a fund for less fortunate colleges and universities? And on my list here, I have Oberlin College on that list as a recipient. And how about no president should be paid more than, say, 10 times the amount paid to the lowest paid faculty member? And then while we're at it, administrators and trustees need to think about reinventing what they do. Michael Crow, president of Arizona State University, calls this the new university. Uh, Ernest Boyer years ago called it the New American College, but it's a different kind of institution and it works differently. There are different incentives, but reinvent higher education. And how about making colleges and universities a driver and a catalyst and a buyer and investor in their local communities? I live dead center Rust Belt. And most of the investment dollars in institutions, the 25 colleges and universities in our region, leave the region instead of staying in the region to help support of uh, new enterprises and sustainability and renewable energy and local foods. And if for those of you who are faculty, teach students to be system thinkers and find the patterns that matter and that connect. Encourage them to have long time perspectives, intergenerational patience. Teach them that raw smartness is never enough without judgment and wisdom and compassion. Teach them to honor the rights of future generations and lives of our non-human kin. The more we learn about animals, the more we see something like intelligence woven through the whole fabric of life. Teach them to be fiercely courageous, adventuresome by being courageous and adventuresome yourself or ourselves. Teach them as well to be less certain about their certainties, but more clear about their convictions. Infuse environment sustainability in courses, green chemistry, law that incorporates the rights of future generations, politics, governance, calibrated to the way the world works as a physical system, businesses that make without destroying, economies in which prices tell the truth. And then harder yet, deal in paradox and ironies and conundrums that go beyond the available knowledge and our academic comfort zone. Explain what's wrong with your professional field. I've often thought that before uh, colleges and universities granted tenure, uh, subjects for tenure or faculty up for tenure ought to go before a whole community in a setting like this and explain what they know and where it fits on the topography of knowledge. How does it fit with other kinds of things? What's dangerous about it? How useful is it? And I'll bet if that was part of the tenure process, there would be whole departments that might disappear. Take risks intellectually. Go to the periphery, get out of the academy regularly, cross discipline bounds and boundaries, defend a more liberal version of the liberal arts. 
help young people become scientifically literate, but not STEM cheerleaders. If the essence of science is skepticism, the only scientific approach to science itself is to be skeptical of its methods, of its results, of its uses. We are, as Lewis Mumford once said, very long on know-how and very short on know-why. And maybe no one should be permitted to publish anything until the age of 50, if ever. <laughs> Socrates published nothing. Help students find a life and a calling before a career. <laughs> Teach them the difference between optimism. If somebody's optimistic, they just don't know enough. If they're in despair, that's a sin, don't go there. The rational position is to be hopeful. And hope I've defined as a verb with the sleeves rolled up. If you're optimistic, or in despair, you won't do anything. But if you're hopeful, you have to do something. You have to act. And then, on a somber note, allow them. Help your students to grieve for the losses they will see in their lives. Teach them a tragic view of life. A tragic view is not gloomy, not long-faced, but resilient, hopeful, and realistic. I keep a statue of Don Quixote on my desk at home and my one at, one at school. And then for faculty, be kind to each other, support each other, encourage each other, band together, hold hands crossing dangerous streets. For you students, you shouldn't graduate without knowing how the world works as a physical system. And if you do, go to the dean's office and demand your money back. You should know why that is important for your lives and careers, and no one should graduate without at least one wilderness or river experience. Get outdoors, as Richard Louv has so eloquently argued. No one should graduate without understanding the causes of our plight, the big numbers of population, resource use, pollution, climate change, extinctions, or the responses to those that we must and should and can make. No one graduates without being able to explain why humans deserve to be sustained. I refer you to the tale of the jinn, the old Islamic tale that has human, uh, humans in the dock and animals given voice and sentience in the jury box. And the question is whether uh, humans can survive or be allowed to stay on the planet. I used to have students in my 101 class at Oberlin assume that they were lawyers and write the brief for humankind. And as good Oberlin students, they, they didn't think there was much reason for us to hang around. But then they thought about it. And you realize that we're the race that had Mozart and Mother Teresa and Pope Francis and art and music and culture. We are the species that first figured out why we should protect other species. There is a case for us. We should know it. And if we better knew why we deserve to survive and be sustained on the planet, we would better know how to go about it. No one should graduate without being able to explain the connection between dead zones, obesity, feedlots, farm policy and government subsidies. No one should graduate without believing, believing that economies can or should grow forever, or that inequality is okay within and between generations. No one should graduate without being able to grow a garden, build a simple structure, tell which way is south or north, describe the ecology of the place and why it should be defended. No one should graduate without knowing at least one animal. No one should graduate as a fundamentalist, technological or religious or culture, but as a thinking person. We have biblical reason to believe that this is true. The scripture says faith, hope, and clarity, but the greatest of these is clarity. That showed me very quickly how many of you are biblical readers. And there's, only, there's a little section back over there that reads about now the rest of you get with it. No one should graduate without a well-developed sense of humor and capacity for self-deprecation. Don't have a career. First and foremost, get a life, callings, and have adventure. And be a lifelong reader and start with books like Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov and Cervantes' Don Quixote. And then finally, to all of us privileged at this time when it is all on the line, Privileged to be the custodians of knowledge, 
learning, life, and the fate of the earth. We're a band of brothers and sisters with the greatest challenge and opportunity that any generation of educators ever had or ever will have to help catalyze what David Corton calls the great turning, Thomas Berry calls it our great work. But we must do that work with what Martin Luther King called the fierce urgency of now. Time is short, and there is such a thing as being too late. The challenge is global. The stakes are total. But if we act as we should and as all of you are, there is a better future for us than what is presently in prospect. This is the greatest time ever to teach, research, and raise up and support and encourage the coming generation. So that when the earth does reach a new equilibrium, which will be hundreds of years, perhaps longer, in the future, our descendants will see this as humanity's finest hour. And you, the educators, teachers, and students, and members of AISHI, as the authors and architects of that world. Thank you.